Welcome to Leading Collaborative Response. The purpose of this content is to explore the impact of leadership on the implementation and sustainability of collaborative response, a system-wide framework that values collaborative, action-focused responses, data-informed discussions, and timely support to ensure all students can experience success. A carefully planned and implemented collaborative response will positively support both students and teachers. Learn more about the why behind the leadership activities that establish, refine, and deepen collaborative response as a foundational framework for success. We are here because we want to build capacity in leading collaborative response within the context that you work. Great leaders build great teams because that is what every child deserves. Welcome again to Leading Collaborative Response. I'm joined by Curtis Hewson, lead learner and co-founder of Jigsaw Learning. And today we're going to talk about timetabling for schools. So Curtis, my first question to you, you've talked about shifting mindsets around timetabling for collaborative response. What do you mean mm -hmm. by that? Well, first off, <laughs> good day. Hope uh, day's going well for you, Jen. Uh, I think when it comes to shifting mindsets, I, I go back to my own personal experience as a principal and coming into a school, nobody showed me how to timetable. It wasn't a course that you took as, as part of principal training. It uh, was just kind of an acquired or learned skill. And coming into a school, you basically adopt whatever timetable is there previously. And then in time, you start making adjustments and changes. Um, but it wasn't until I was in my third school that really had a shift in the mindset, the way that went about the overall design of a timetable right from, from, uh, from scratch. And the shift that happened is previously I would come to a master timetable and after you've determined, okay, when's bus time's arrival and how long's our, our recess and all of those things that go into that master timetable. When we started to construct teacher and class timetables, I always started with, okay, how am I going to get the teachers their time free from instruction, their prep time? Um, and I put that in place first, make sure, you know, and this person likes having their prep at the end of the day, and this person doesn't like to teach art. So if someone else could do their art, and, you know, all of those little idiosyncrasies that would go in, then once that was accomplished, then I would start to take time to determine, okay, let's plan the spaces. So who's in the gym and when? the library, those common spaces within the school that had to be planned out. Um, and then once we had those big rocks in, we'd hand teachers their timetable and say, all right, make sure that you meet all of your minimum time requirements in each of the areas, but you slot where you wanna do your mathematics, your social, um, LA, whatnot. But then when we got to a place of, boy, it sure be nice if we had embedded time for collaboration. It was really hard to do without upsetting somebody's gym times, their prep times, their music classes, whatnot. And then when we got to a place of what if we could timetable intervention time for kids, it was next to impossible to get consistent times for groups of students, because if you did it for this one or two grade levels, it would impact this class who had phys ed during that time. Um, really, it came down to the understanding that old adage of when you're filling a pitcher, if you start with the sand, then put in the gravel, then the rocks, you may not have enough room for the rocks, but if you flip that and start with the rocks, then sprinkle in the gravel, then the sand, we can get it all fit in. And that was the huge shift that went from us shifting from what I would consider adult focused timetabling, where we were trying to really look at the adults needs first to student focused timetabling, and the shift that happened was, let's plan the intervention time first. It's the first big rock that goes into our timetable. So we're going to determine for this particular set of classes that this block is going to become in time their intervention. And it, we, we would just take a pencil and just shade out that particular block in the schedule that we're going to make sure nothing flows into that time. Then we would plan the collaboration then the time free from instruction or the prep time, and then finally the spaces. So it was changing, flipping that mindset. And I've done that now in dozens of, or help support dozens of schools do that. And the process works, but you start with the intervention, 
then the collaboration, and then you attend to the um, time free from instruction and planning out the spaces. And again, it's, it's never as simple as that, um, as there's just a whole lot of different facets that come into play when we're planning out timetables. But flipping that mindset is a huge and important shift, I think, when schools are moving from adult focused to response focused um, timetabling efforts. So sorry, that was a bit of a rambling, but uh, hopefully demonstrates how just flipping that understanding and starting with intervention, then collaboration made a huge impact on timetabling. You made it sound incredibly simple, yet it's I not. know that it's not. <laughs> so what are some ways that you've seen schools come to terms with the idea of providing collaborative time for staff? What are they doing in those timetables to make that happen? Yeah, so I, I think my first piece of advice, and this is, again, not always easy, is um, try some different things. Um, ask your staff, what would be some ways that we could free us up in order to get some collaboration time built in? How could we get it um, embedded in? There's so many ways that I've seen schools be able to build in that collaborative time, um, but it's always contextual. What works in one school will not work in another. Um, but some ideas or considerations, I've seen a lot of schools implement buddy or mentor type programs. The idea that, you know, we bring together two classes to engage in some um, buddy activity, whether it's buddy reading or we're going to do some math activities together. Um, but we bring those classes together one time one teacher stays while another one's released for collaboration time. Next time that we meet, the other person is released for the collaboration time. I've seen a lot of schools have incredible success with the idea of making slightly larger groups at different points during a week for instruction so that they can release people off the floor for collaboration. Now, COVID made this really difficult in schools with cohorting. Um, that was at play, but I've often used the, the idea of how could we take, release two people by having one person cover their classes, or how could I release three by having two cover, or release four by having two or three um, cover. It, it's a different type of thinking than a one for one, the idea that in order for you to go off the floor, somebody has to come and take your class, that's the one for one exchange. But I've seen lots of success where we'll make a slightly larger group for a library book exchange, um, while another group, a slightly larger group is in phys ed, and then we flip them and we have two adults that are covering those while releasing three people, uh, three classroom teachers off the floor. I've seen lots and lots of examples of uh, making those larger groups through numerous different ways, such as assemblies, uh, such as um, um, subjects like phys ed, uh, art, music, where we can have a little bit of a bigger group that come into play. Um, I've seen schools that have set up rotations of, of learning where they build in makerspace um, time in there as well, so that again, we can release teachers off the floor. Within my own school, um, we often provided that time by our assistant principal um, covering classes so that then as principal, I could be involved in the collaborative efforts that were happening as well. So I, I, there is no one tried and true way, but it, it does require a little bit of out of the box thinking and trying something that may or may not work for creating that collaborative time. So Curtis, you've brought to mind a couple of ideas that I want to touch on. So I'm going to put you on the spot. Yeah. The first one's going to be that a number of the examples that you've shared are a really elementary, primary, middle school sort of examples where you have the ability to have classes of students. Yeah. Have you seen anything tried and true or that's been working really well at a high school level about creating that collaborative time for teachers? Yeah, the most common one that I see at the high school 
level that again I've I've helped and worked through with a few different schools is the creation of a flex or a tutorial kind of block where um, the students are engaging in in um, different activities, but it allows us to release people uh, off the floor, uh, for example. So for instance, in Morinville Community uh, High School, they have a block at the end of the day that is set out for intervention, time for students, tutorials that they can attend. Um, but then what they do is on Tuesdays, for instance, the math department is released off the floor to be able to um, attend to their collaborative efforts. The next day, another team is released off the floor. I saw this in another uh, large high school in Medicine Hat where they had some embedded tutorial time that was happening on Fridays. And essentially what they would do is they would split their staff into three groupings. One third of the staff stayed on the floor to support and supervise the students. Another third were involved in faculty or department meetings, while another third were in collaborative team meetings that were cross-departmental. And then each week they'd cycle through that one week as a staff, I'd be on the floor. Next week, I'm in a faculty meeting. Next week, I'm in a collaborative team meeting. And then the cycle uh, starts over again. That's typically what I've seen at the high school in regards to creating that time, other than utilizing assignable time at the beginning or end of day. But I, I really do like the idea of trying to embed it uh, right in and that whole idea of pulling people off the floor during flex blocks or tutorial blocks is really important. However, I would um, argue or I, I guess I've seen where that doesn't work very well if we haven't clearly articulated what are the students doing during this time so that it doesn't become, <laughs> I've, heard, I've heard it often referred to as high school recess, um, where if it's not clearly articulated, um, who knows what the kids are doing or they take off and actually we've created a bigger problem than the one we were trying to solve by getting collaborative and intervention time built in. So the second idea that came to mind as you were talking earlier is that notion of timetabling for administrators. Mm -hmm. How are schools timetabling to make sure that there's an administrative presence at their collaborative team meetings? How does that happen? Yeah. Um, so a number of different ways. Again, within my own school, um, we, between my administrative partner and I, we had um, determined that my role was to be in the meetings to help be the instructional leader. Her role was to help provide the release time. Um, so that was one function that we utilize. I've seen other schools where they'll switch and, and flip that. Uh, I've always believed that my role is that when teams are engaged in collaborative planning efforts, I'm available to support if invited or if I need to help come in and support or um, help help adjust the, the priority areas that teams are looking at. But then I'm absolutely coming in during the collaborative team meetings to be part of those conversations uh, for students. So I think oftentimes we see that it men lots of times in a lot of schools are the ones providing the release time for teams to meet. But I would argue in time, trying to find different ways to be able to do that so that the admin can be part of those conversation. And obviously not every admin, um, but again, within that small example of being able to um, have one partner covering off classes while the other was engaged in collaboration. I have seen schools too, where they utilize some sub time so that when collaborative team meetings happen, um, a sub comes in to be able to provide some of the coverage that's, that's happening that admin had previously been, been uh, responsible for taking. So again, it's, it's so hard to give the one example because it, it varies wildly from each individual school context. And that's again, where I say, try something. And if it doesn't work, then it might lead to an aha for what could be a different consideration for us to look at. Much like collaborative response in general, it is entirely contextual and what you're able to do within a school with the resources that you have. On our Jigsaw Learning website, we are starting to collect multiple samples of timetabling overviews um, 
that are available, different ideas. Um, again, it's, it takes a little bit of out of the box thinking for how can we provide that, that time for, for our collaboration so that it's embedded and we see it as it's just part of what we do every day for students. We spent a lot of time talking about timetabling for the collaboration. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the intervention block as being the first thing you put in place. Yep. What might be some considerations that schools need to take when they're timetabling and planning for that intervention block? Yeah, so there's been some real ahas and learnings that's happened through the idea of building the intervention or the flex or the tutorial block um, through a number of different schools. The first thing I would argue is build it into the timetable, even if you're not ready to use it yet. And what I mean by that is within my own school, it was ready for about a year and a half before we started to say, what if during this time, these students in these particular grades could get intervention? And it really stemmed from a, we're trying to provide additional supports for students, but it was pullout primarily. And teachers were getting really frustrated that, yes, I know this student needs some additional reading intervention for uh, for example, but for them to get it, they're getting pulled out of my science class and they're missing this or they're missing that. Or um, you know, it wasn't unusual of a kid doesn't want to go because they're going to miss something in the classroom. So being able to build in a time where everybody is receiving intervention and support, some in smaller groups, some in larger groups, some are, are receiving enrichment during that time, but building it right into the timetable um, to start is really important. So um, I've worked with schools where they built it in that every day during block three, it's intended that Div 1 will have intervention time, but we're not quite ready to do it yet. Um, so teachers are going to utilize that with their own homeroom classes to do what they wish. Uh, and then we're going to reach a place where maybe we'll start off with two days a week and try it, and then three. And, and uh, that idea of growing into the time, but that it's already established in the, in the timetable, which again is what I started off with, with the idea of make it a big rock and put it in first. Then some of the other things that we've discovered is when possible, and it takes a little bit of, of effort and thought, being able to have multiple intervention blocks during a day that are designated for different um, grade, um, grade or age levels of students. So I've worked with a small school where they had one block that was their K to five intervention time and another block during the day that was their six to nine. Um, what that allows us to do, and within my own school, larger school where we would have, this block is grade one intervention, this block is grade two intervention, this block is grade three, this one's grade four, this one's grade five, this one's grade six, uh, at different times during the day. What that allowed us to do is funnel additional adults into those intervention times, where if it's one block for the entire school uh, during the day, it doesn't allow us to double dip some of our staff members where in our example, where we had a grade one block, a grade two and a grade three, we could assign a learning support teacher, for instance, to be involved in one, two and three. So uh, essentially we've, we've with one person created three potential groupings where if it was happening during the same time, you'd only be able to get one with that one person. And we would, during the intervention time, steal educational assistance where appropriate. If we had student teachers in the building, they would be available. During that intervention time, we just tried to flood as many adults as we could in order to get the group small. But then some of the other things we learned through this is when setting up the intervention times, it's important to work through cycles. And so what I mean by that is we're gonna have a three week cycle where a student's going to attend this particular intervention, then we're going to reassess, redetermine, and look at another cycle for another three weeks. Um, or for schools that say, this student's going to go into a science tutorial for four days or for two days or whatever that looks like, but always having an end 
to when is the cycle so that we don't create the system of this kid always goes to this room during that time. Uh, the other thing that we found has been incredibly important during that intervention, flex, tutorial, whatever we want to refer to as that block, is have real clarity for our staff and our students of what happens during that time. So I worked with a school in Edmonton where they, for every room that the kids could go to during that time, they made it clear of what's happening in this room. What's the focus? Within my own school, when we built reading interventions, we actually use the exact same lesson planning format for every group that um, students were being placed within, whether it was a group that was needing high levels of support or an enrichment group, but it was the same 30 minute structure, 10 minutes of direct instruction, 10 minutes of reading, practicing the skill with actual literature, and then 10 minutes of a game to practice the skill. We use the same format for every child. And the beauty of that is it allowed us to start recycling intervention lessons uh, for this. So when I've got this group that's focusing in on um, digraphs for the next two weeks, then three months later, I've got another group that we want to look at for digraphs. Now we've got a, a set of lessons ready to go that we can just continue to utilize um, so that in time, it becomes less about planning um, for those intervention time and more about the actual engagement and, and helping to support the students. So again, it's, I know I'm talking in big, broad strokes, but really, really important for how we think about designing a schedule that allows the time for intervention and for staff collaboration. I'm a big believer that both are incredibly important when we're talking about effectively responding to the needs of all students within a school. And I liked your idea of building it in, building that solid framework first so that you have it in place and then you can grow into that. Yeah. Much the same way as we start in small pieces with collaborative response, knowing that there's a framework for big things to happen. Absolutely. And I think as well, when we talk about that growing into, it also allows us to pilot, you know, let's pilot with one particular group of students or a grade of what will the intervention time look like? Like, let's, let's just go in small steps, rather than we're going to put all 800 of our students into this intervention block. And two months later, we're, we're abandoning it because it we weren't clear on what, what it is that we do during that time. Curtis, your wisdom and the insight is always appreciated. And I know that between what you have to share here, the resources available on the website that schools are sharing with their own timetables, there's plenty out there for our audience to take advantage of. So thank and you I'd again. Encourage, encourage people to reach out if I, I can help. I've gone into many schools and sat down and in half a day we've come up with some different timetabling ideas that sometimes an, an another set of eyes helps to, to think of possibilities. There's a reason that the logo is puzzle pieces and the <laughs> timetables have puzzle pieces of their own as part of the bigger structure. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you again for being here with us and we look forward to hearing what comes next. All right. Thanks so much, Jen. Appreciate it.